Can you answer the questions correctly? Find out in this activity that is customized to you. Test your current knowledge with the series of questions related to the topic and rate your confidence for each answer. If you answered correctly and were confident, you will move on to the next question. If you need a little more information about the topic, an expert will provide evidence that supports the most appropriate answer choice. Then you will have the opportunity to try again with a similar scenario. When you have finished all of the questions, a summary page with your results will be provided, along with links to all of the expert presentations for your reference. Earn credit by answering the review questions at the end. Let's get started with your first question. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Revealing the Neuropathology of Alzheimer's Disease Through Novel Fluid and Imaging Biomarkers, Ushering in a Precision Era of Diagnosis and Treatment. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash UHK860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello. This is Dr. James Howard from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Welcome to this educational activity on myasthenia gravis. If you have not already watched the introduction, please do so now. We're going to begin with a topic on recognizing the signs and symptoms of generalized myasthenia gravis. What is myasthenia? What is MG? It's an autoimmune neuromuscular disorder that's diagnosed by symptom recognition with or without the presence of antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, to the musk protein, or the LRP4 protein. These antibodies bind to various determinants on the postsynaptic membrane of the neuromuscular junction, and most commonly in 85% to the acetylcholine receptor itself. The symptoms of myasthenia gravis are quite varied, and we call this a snowflake disease. And while there are common themes, each individual has its own presentation and subtleties that need to be recognized in order to come to a diagnosis. They may involve multiple domains, ocular, bulbar, respiratory, and limb, as well as axial muscles. While ocular presentation is most common, 85% of individuals will ultimately experience generalized disease. The core manifestations of myasthenia are fatigable muscle weakness, made worse by activity, improved with rest, only to recur once the activity is resumed, first noted back in the 1600s by the anatomist Sir Thomas Willis. And it's the symptom fluctuation which is the hallmark of the disease. And to be able to demonstrate that, particularly in the eyelid or the muscles of eye movement, one has essentially made the diagnosis of myasthenia. Bulbar weakness involvement results in dysarthria, dysphagia, weakness and fatigue of the jaw with chewing, with speech, etc. Axial weakness may affect the neck, more often neck flexion than extension, but neither is spared. Limb weakness is typically symmetrical, more proximal, but distal muscles are also involved. And this includes weakness of finger flexion, extension, foot drop. 15 to 20% of patients with MG can develop respiratory weakness. And in worst cases, this results in what we call myasthenic crisis, the need for mechanical ventilatory support. There is a classification system for myasthenia. Class zero is remission. Class five, as we already said, is respiratory failure requiring intubation and ventilatory assistance. Class one are those who have restricted ocular disease. It may be simply a droop of the eyelid, or it may be double vision or combinations thereof. Class two is mild, three moderate, four severe. And then we subdivide these three classes by the overwhelming or the predominance of the presentation. 
A, if it's predominantly limb, and B, if it's predominantly bulbar symptoms. There are subtypes of myasthenia, which I've already alluded to. Most commonly, ACHR antibody positive MG. Uh, we have antibodies in 85% of these individuals, and they may present with thymic hyperplasia. And in 12 to 15% of cases, they may have an actual tumor of the gland, a thymoma. While typically benign, it can be metastatic with local invasion within the chest and more rarely with extension outside of the chest. Musk antibody positive myasthenia, antibody to the muscle specific protein kinase, is found in some 7 to 10 percent of patients who have MG, and in 40 percent of those patients who are seronegative for ACHR antibody. And then we have other subtypes. LRP4 antibody to the lipo, uh, lipoprotein uh, receptor protein 4, and then those that we call seronegative, and usually double or triple if one has done a complete uh, workup. First and foremost, it's a clinical disease that we identify through the history and a good neuromuscular examination. And as I'd already said, the variability of the lid or the muscles of eye movement are very characteristic, and there's really no other disease that will do this. We can confirm our clinical impressions with serologic testing for antibodies to ACHR, MUSK, or LRP4. And in seropositive, this diagnosis is confirmed in the appropriate clinical setting. There are rare false positives uh, patients to ACHR antibody, uh, but they are quite uncommon. We can also use electrophysiological studies to confirm our clinical diagnosis. Most commonly, particularly in the community, it's repetitive nerve stimulation, looking for the electrodecremental response we see with successive stimuli uh, to the nerve. In certain areas, one has the ability to do single fiber EMG and measure the jitter, the variability of synaptic transmission. Uh, and this is the gold standard where we can achieve 98 plus percent of diagnostic sensitivity as opposed to 50, 60 percent diagnostic sensitivity with repetitive nerve stimulation. Rep stim requires synaptic failure, the end stage of disease, where a single fiber EMG is simply looking at that point in which the end plate potential reaches action potential threshold. And that variability we term neuromuscular jitter. And once we have established the diagnosis, there are a variety of other testing things that need to be done, uh, including looking at the thyroid status because of the coexistence of other autoimmune diseases, B12, in some cases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. We also need to address the thymus gland because we already said many of these individuals, particularly younger individuals, will have thymic hyperplasia uh, or a tumor of the thymus gland, as we said, in 10 to 12% of individuals. There are diagnostic pitfalls in myasthenic mimics, an atypical presentation. For mimics, we have to keep in mind the Lambert-Eaton syndrome, a presynaptic disorder rather than a postsynaptic disorder, an abnormality due to impaired neurotransmitter release, in 50% of patients associated with a cancer, typically small cell carcinoma of the lung, and many others, it's another autoimmune disorder. Theoretically, brainstem gliomas could mimic the ocular presentation and some generalized weakness. Multiple sclerosis has often been misidentified um, as having myasthenia in the early presentation because it waxes and wanes or comes and goes. Botulism is sometimes confused, and there uh, that is a descending paralysis, unlike Guillain-Barre, which is an ascending paralysis. There are inflammatory myopathies that could confuse uh, the individual, and Graves' ophthalmopathy because of the prominent eye involvement and the restricted eye movement. And so again, it's careful history, careful neuromuscular examination, looking to elicit the variability with time, the fluctuating 
coming and going of symptoms in association with the appropriate clinical picture uh, that will give us the diagnosis. And in this module, uh, let's review the goals of treatment. And there are guidelines. Many countries have their own. There is an international consortium that put together a consensus document regarding management of myasthenia gravis uh, by the MGFA. And this task force stated that the goal should be minimal manifestations or better. Minimal manifestations are those individuals who have perhaps some minor weakness, but it's non-functional. So there may be a hint of a droopy eyelid, or they may not be able to turn the corners of their mouth up appropriately. Or if you really strain, you may be able to budge a teeny bit their shoulders or their neck. Non-functional impairment, and we would classify this as minimal manifestations. We can take this one step further and use minimal symptom expression. And we'll come to the outcome measures that we use, one of which is the activities of daily living score and minimal symptom expression, MSE. Another goal uh, is MGADL scores of zero or one. But going back to the task force, they also said that adverse events as the result of our treatment should be absent or mild, class one or less. And they defined remission as having no signs or symptoms of MG other than weakness of eye closure. And in the majority of patients with MG, that muscle never becomes normal. But on careful exam, and I underscore the word careful, there is no evidence of weakness in any other muscle group. We know that myasthenia impacts the patient in multiple ways. There are burdens, there are risks, and this is made worse by suboptimal treatment. And patients complain, and their most common complaint is muscle fatigue. Myasthenia, because of the fatigue and because of the weakness, tends to make people become anxious, lonely, depressed. They feel like they're a burden to their friends and their family. They're afraid to get out and go for fear that they may be weak or become weak during an activity and then be stranded, if you will. In addition, suboptimal treatment increases the risk of myasthenic worsening, which increases healthcare utilization, in terms of clinic visits, hospitalizations, and in the worst of cases, ICU care uh, in prolonged hospital stays. We have found that up to 50% of treated patients do not meet the goal of minimal symptom expression, as I said, measured by the activities of daily living score of a zero of one. 20% of patients uh, treated uh, are refractory to therapy. Now, that number is debated in certain circles, and it depends upon the definition of uh, refractoriness, and it varies in various uh, situations. But in general, 15, 20% do not have a great response to uh, tre treatment. And then if you add in the adverse event profiles of your treating regimen, I believe this figure goes up over 50%. In addition to failing to recognize patients who have not done well, uh, we often as clinicians overestimate patient satisfaction with treatment and underestimate the burden of disease and the burden of treatment. And the patient often believes they should not burden us with other things. And they don't bring to our attention the global impact of the disease in their overall well being. And so, under development are a variety of apps that are gathering real world patient reported outcome measures. These are observational studies. Uh, this is occurring throughout several countries. And the data, helpful, hopefully, will allow us to improve our understanding of the generalized myasthenic patient in terms of its natural history, in terms of its humanistic and economic burdens, its clinical features, and epidemiology. There's one app that's being developed now that will actually measure ptosis. It will measure strength as manifested by arm outstretch times. Uh, it will measure dysarthria 
by detecting voice uh, pattern changes in one's spoken speech. A survey conducted by MG News with nearly a thousand uh, respondents uh, demonstrated what I show you here, that 28% were very satisfied with, with their uh, disease, um, but about 13% were dissatisfied, somewhat or extremely dissatisfied. And there was about 14% uh, in the middle. And then when asked about their quality of life, uh, it's very interesting that the numbers who were satisfied with their treatment response, their quality of life was much less. Nearly 40% of the respondents highlighted fatigue as the most uh, as the symptom that most affected their, their daily life and their quality of life. And we've had this theme uh, throughout the, this talk um, and identified fatigue as the most bothersome adverse event in terms of their, their treatment. We don't know what causes this myasthenic fatigue, and we don't have good treatments to date uh, that will address this directly. Um, and there, further research needs to be done. There is some data coming out that some of our newer therapies may improve upon this, uh, and that will be very gratifying to us as well as our patient community. So the next question comes, what drives a clinician to change treatment? What are the indications? And I think we can put these in several categories. One is that efficacy wanes. And we've seen that with a number of the therapeutics that we currently use. Uh, and it's the most common reason we have for either switching a drug or stopping a therapy. Um, people who are wedded to corticosteroids such that we can't taper the dose. And as we attempt to taper the dose, they have exacerbations of their myasthenia. And so we have to push the dose of prednisone back up. Now, the risk of that is the accumulating adverse event profile over time due to the higher corticosteroid doses for much longer periods. The other thing to change uh, therapy is those individuals have repeated exacerbations or myasthenic crises. On average, patients will have one to two crises in the preceding years um, before they come under good control. And the individual who continues to have these on a repeated basis, for whatever reason, one should consider, do I need to change my management strategy? And of course, uh, the inability to tolerate a treatment because of a particular adverse event. Even with suboptimal disease control, we find that many healthcare providers and patients alike are reluctant to change treatment strategies. Well, part of it uh, is that we don't have a good consensus on what optimal disease control is, uh, and we're getting better in the International Consortium guidelines that were published says minimal manifestations Others of us say minimal symptom expression uh, with minimal to no adverse events. And so that's changing the uh, thought patterns, but still we see this as an issue. The other is that the patient has been put on therapy and because these drugs take a long time to work, in many instances, four to six months to start working, well over a year, year and a half for maximum effect, there's one that may take three years, to achieve maximum effect. There's this wait and see approach. We have to come to the realization that if we're not seeing any response within a defined period of time based on the therapeutic we've chosen, we need to think about a new one. And there's this new normal that patients uh, develop because of the insidious evolution of the disease. They adapt to it subconsciously and give up hobbies, give up things that they enjoy attributed to other causes when in fact it's due to their MG. And then some people modify their activities of daily living. Um, in the MGADL score, one of the questions is, do you have difficulty combing your hair or brushing your teeth? And I had this woman who had no anti-gravity function in her arms who said she was normal. I said, now, wait a minute. How can you be normal when you can't lift your arms up? She says, oh, I just kneel on the floor, lay across the, the edge of my bed, and then comb my hair that way. 
but these coping strategies can have negative consequences. And so the limitation of physical activity clearly has an impact on our general health, contributes to obesity, cardiometabolic disorders, and the reduced participation in day-to-day -day activities affects one's interpersonal relationships with their work colleagues, with home, their overall quality of life. And it may mask the limitation of patient treatment. And so the poorly controlled individual who is adapting and coping to all of these may not give the appropriate histories to the clinician that I'm not doing well. And so one has to listen intently to what the patient is saying in terms of their day-to-day -day activities to see if we can ferret out such limitations that are telling us that no, this isn't true response to therapy, this is adaptive behavior that is then clouding the true response of the drug. But then we have to go through and evaluate the decision that is made longitudinally. Did we make the right decision? Are we experiencing new adverse events? Are we delayed in obtaining the response that we have? And these are ongoing discussions and rediscussions with the patient. The MGADL and other outcome measures that have been developed were first designed for use in clinical trials. Um, but several of them have become very adaptable to our day-to-day -day clinical practice. And I've listed a few here. The MGADL score, which we have talked about, eight items algorithmically delivered by the clinician or the treating staff to the patient and then queried and the score is summed. The QMG score is much more involved and that's an extension of our clinical examination. And I find in clinical practice, it takes too long. Uh, and while it's an excellent tool to measure clinical response, it's not practical in a community or even an academic clinical practice. And so it's typically reserved for the research realm. The MG composite scale is uh, a composite of the MGADL score and the QMG score, but one can substitute one's own clinical examination for the latter. And it gives us a different slant on things, looking at both symptoms as well as function. And then there's an MG specific quality of life instrument. The 15R is a revised edition of the original version uh, and it's 15 items and the patient scores zero, one, uh, and two. The first, the ADL, the QOL are very easily administered, take no more than a couple minutes to administer in the clinic, but can give you good longitudinal data over time. And this is the MGADL score here, an eight item assessment that it helps assess uh, a quantitative measure of, of symptoms in terms of severity uh, and, and to some degree frequency. And we use it routinely every time we encounter a patient because it's quickly administered and gives us trend analysis over time. So why incorporate it? Um, because it provides an insight into the patient's symptom load and the functional impact at various points in time, before I start a treatment, during a treatment, and after treatment. Uh, and as I said earlier, it's longitudinal and we can look for trend analysis. It's a semi-objective measure of our efficacy. Um, it also may increase the patient engagement. They may take an interest now and pay closer attention to signs and symptoms that they can relate to us. And then we have used it to identify patients who may be starting to exacerbate. Yes, there is noise in the system and a one point change may not mean anything, but if I see successive one point deteriorations, uh, increasing score, then I'm worried. I may bring the patient in earlier. And we administer this over the phone with many of our patients uh, in between clinic visits if we happen to be in conversation with them. So when we consider treatment modifications, um, and the limitations of conventional treatments are that they're broadly immune suppressive, but there are new things in the pike uh, and we have changing paradigms. There's a huge push for targeted selective therapies 
And with this, as I said, comes reduced adverse event profiles. And these novel and emerging therapies are targeting the pathophysiology directly. One is complement inhibition. We know that antibodies activate complement in many of our patients. And the formation of the terminal complement complex, what we used to call the membrane attack complex, architecturally destroys the neuromuscular junction, resulting in muscle weakness. We're also targeting the neonatal FC receptor. And by inhibiting the neonatal FC receptor, FCRN, we can selectively clear IgG antibodies by rather than salvaging them and recirculating them to the, uh, the, the bloodstream, we can move them to the lysosome for destruction. And there are many others. The eculizumab was the first ever approved treatment for myasthenia gravis in 2017. Remember, this was recognized in the mid 1600s, and we've stolen everything from the transplant world. Um, and this monoclonal antibody binds the complement protein C5 and then prevents its uh, formation of C5A and C5B. And C5B combines with 6, 7, 8, multiple copies of C9 to form the membrane attack complex. Ravaluzumab is a cousin of eculizumab. It's actually the same drug engineered to go from an every two week infusion cycle to every eight weeks. Targets the same, C5, uh, and it's weight-based and its risks are identical. All complement inhibitors have essentially the same adverse event profiles. Um, and then there's Zylucaplan, which is a little bit different. Uh, this is at the FDA uh, here at the end of 2022, uh, and hopefully it will be approved in the first to second quarter of 2023. But it binds to complement protein 5, but also 5B. And so if any complement gets dissociated, C5 to C5A and C5B, it has a second chance of getting C5B. And again, inhibits the formation of the attack complex. This is not intravenously administered. This is administered by daily sub-Q uh, injections of a very small volume, uh, and it is extremely well uh, tolerated. There are several FCRN antagonists. The only one that is approved is Fgartigamod. Uh, it's an IgG1 fragment, uh, and it's the first in class. It's administered by intravenous infusion on four weekly uh, doses, and then patients are observed, and we've seen durability that goes from every four to six weeks in 11% of patients to more than 50% having durability of response in excess of two months and a third in excess of three months. But several other FCRN inhibitors are in trial right now. Rosanaliximab has just completed phase three. This is a subcutaneous infusion. It's not an injection, it's an infusion. Uh, Nepocalumab is an intravenous infusion uh, every two weeks. Uh, that is still in phase three. And betoclumab uh, is just starting a phase three a trial. Fgartigamod is completing a trial with a subcutaneous formulation uh, that in the initial data that has been presented shows non-inferiority to the IV infusion. And so patients will have a choice of IV versus sub-Q uh, uh, to meet their particular needs. So in summary, MG is a very rare chronic autoimmune disorder. Uh, that is highly variable. The symptoms fluctuate hour by hour, day by day, uh, and with a varied clinical presentation, and whose symptoms overlap with other conditions. Weakness is weakness, regardless of cause, and it makes the diagnosis challenging. And we can diminish that challenge by very careful uh, history and focused neuromuscular examinations. Treatment responses are variable. And patients' coping capabilities may mask the true response that they've had uh, to the treatment. And then the patient-reported outcome measures, particularly the MGADL, uh, can help guide our treatment decisions, easily administered by the treating staff in the clinic over the phone, but will give insight to the longitudinal course of the individual over time. And then we have new and emerging therapeutics. 
MG has become a hotspot for pharma. Um, but we're thankful for their interest because it's going to bring new therapeutics to our patient population that are much better tolerated than what we have in our current toolbox. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Have a good day. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash UHK 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.